you. You may be seated. All right, let's turn to the book of Mark, chapter number one tonight. Mark, chapter number one, if we could. When Christian Herter was the governor of the state of Massachusetts, he was running hard for a second term in office. One day after a busy morning chasing votes and no lunch, he arrived at a church barbecue. It was late afternoon and Herter was just famished. As Herter moved down the serving line, he held out his plate to the woman serving chicken. She put a piece on his plate and turned to the next person in line. Excuse me, the governor heard her said. Do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? Sorry, the woman told him. I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. But I'm starved, the governor said. Sorry, the woman said again. Only one to a customer. Governor Herder was a modest and unassuming man, but he decided that this time he would, show, he would throw a little weight around. He said, do you know who I am? He said, I am the governor of this state. Do you know who I am, the woman said. I'm the lady in charge of the chickens, so I'll move along, mister. <laughs> hey, regardless of the position in life, we all have our limitations, don't we? <laughs> but not the Lord Jesus Christ. His power and his authority dominate the universe, and nothing is too hard for him. Now in our text, Jesus is going to begin really focusing his ministry on what we would call northern Israel, the Galilean region. And it's here that great displays of his power will come into full view. As we've been in this new series, verse by verse through the book of Mark, we're going to continue on uh, from this morning in verse number 21. It says here, And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils, and all the city was gathered together at the door." And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Tonight, let's continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of the Gospel of Mark as we talk about the Galilean crusade. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this written word, this testimonial account of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as we dig into this passage tonight that we could see more of his greatness and, Lord, that our lives could be striving to reflect it in, in some capacity, that you would use us more readily in this time frame in which we live. If there's anything that we need more in our society, it's a little more Jesus, certainly, or a lot more, really. And, Father, I pray tonight that you would bless our time and thy word, strengthen us, encourage us, challenge us, as you see fit, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we've seen, it's been about a year, year and a half into the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Mark, as I mentioned this morning, doesn't record all the events for us, but picks it up, really, as we saw in verse 14, after 
John the Baptist had been imprisoned. Now, there were a lot of things that took place. I mentioned them this morning. But I believe that there was a particular reason, of course, why Mark picks up here. And I believe those events uh, were used prior uh, to affirm his identity to his disciples who were following him. It's at this time, though, Jesus Christ begins to single out what would become the 12 key men who would travel with him, and he taught specifically, or would be taught specifically, by the Lord himself. And we saw this morning that the first four were called out, Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Now, after picking these four, they head to Capernaum. Capernaum is a small village on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. If you were to go over to the Holy Land, and I've been there, as I, as I mentioned before, I've been to the, the ruins of the city of Capernaum, and it's just right there on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, and, and there's a lot of things that they've excavated, and they believe that there's a certain spot where Peter's house possibly was. There was actually a church that's uniquely built that covers it. It looks like a spider hanging over the place. That's another, another issue. But uh, it's very interesting to be there and, and to be in the synagogue that they have unearthed there. And most likely it, that, that synagogue is on the same location as the synagogue that Jesus would go and preach in. It's, it's quite fascinating to stand there and just think about th- these are the very areas that Jesus walked in. And this was evidently Capernaum, the hometown of Simon and Andrew, or Peter as we would know him. It would be in this town and all around the Galilee that Christ's power would come in fuller display. They would, it would really break out here. A key word found twice in our passage is this word authority. Authority. Verse 22, it mentions, he taught them as one that had authority. Authority. Look at verse 27. For with authority he commandeth even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. The word authority is defined as the legal power or right to command or act as the authority of a prince over subjects and parents over children. It's also considered uh, a synonym to words like power, rule, and sway. As the Creator, Jesus Christ has universal authority over all the creation. The creation itself is to submit to what he decrees. The problem with the human race, though, is that our sin nature wants to rebel against those decrees, right? And we call those rebellion against the decrees something very simple. It's called sin. And sin creates a disruption in God's order of the universe. Hence, the problems we face are the natural ramifications of of sin. Romans 8.22, for we know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Why? Because our sin disrupts God's order of this universe. And the more we sin, the more disruption we cause. <laughs> and consider now today cl- closing in on 8 billion people on planet earth and all the sin that goes on there. You can about imagine there is a lot of disruption. Hence, so much so that the creation groans and travails in pain to now. Remember, God is the only one with authority to say what is true, what is false, what is right, what is wrong. He is the ruling power of the universe. The devil has been trying to steal that, though, from the Lord ever since he got the harebrained idea that he could be God. Isaiah 14, 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. That was a bad idea. And the whole creation is paying as a result of that. Now in our text, the authority Jesus possesses comes into full view, which creates a, an interesting effect. What happens? When he is lifted up, all people are drawn to him, aren't they? People are naturally drawn to him. You know, when we lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what's going to happen too? People are going to be drawn to him. People are going to be drawn to him. I'm kind of troubled when people say, I'm so spiritual, nobody wants to talk to me or have that attitude. Let me tell you something. You're not spiritual then. Because Jesus, people were drawn to him because there was a power that came out of him that was very unique. And spiritual people, honestly, I I believe are people that people are drawn to, actually. You'd be surprised. 
The angry, super spiritual crowd attracts nobody. But they say, oh, I'm being persecuted. No, it's your attitude that people don't like. It's not an attitude like Jesus. It's an attitude of self-righteous pride. There's a big difference there. We take right stands, but we have to have a right spirit. We don't have the right spirit at the right stands. Our, our stands will be worthless. They really will be. Everyone was, look, everyone's drawn to him. He's drawn to them. So let's consider this a little bit more closely tonight. Our text and, and what we can learn about this Galilean crusade that he is on. First off, let's talk about the doctrinal authority. Verse 21, And when they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. I like that little snub at the end there for the scribes, but, but we see here as Jesus comes to a synagogue, the synagogue there in Capernaum, I mentioned a moment ago, he begins to teach. He begins to teach. And his teaching astonished people. So much so they, they could say, you know what, this man has some authority. He knows what he's talking about when it comes to biblical matters. And no doubt the things that he was saying started helping people connect the dots on some spiritual things they had problems with before. And he knew what he was talking about because the people could understand from a practical and logical position what he said was true. What he said was true. It wasn't just a bunch of hierarchy fluff. It wasn't just a bunch of ecclesiastical words. It was stuff that answered questions and gave direction that was wise. And he just completely put the normal scribes to shame here. <laughs> Again, it, Mark says, and not as the scribes. You talk about kind of a little diss there. <laughs> but he was unique compared, I mean, there was a night and day difference between the scribes and Christ. Very, very big difference. Enough where, where Mark calls it out. You know, I remember when I first sat under Bible preaching for the first time in my life in and, and a Bible study in that church, and I, I, remember, I remember especially the first church service I ever went to at Fargo Baptist. And I and remember, I don't even know what he talked about, but I remember going to church and it would be 45 minutes long. It was the longest 45 minutes of my life. I mean, I could not wait to get out of what I grew up in. But then I sat under that preaching and, and the pastor opened the Bible and and we went through lots of verses and, and, make, and uh, making logical sense. And I was like, and he was done. I was like, really? He was done? And I looked at the clock and I was like, wow. I got more out of that in one service than I would ever done it ever before. Why? Because when real Bible preaching is going forth and we have a tender and receptive heart, it's just like, you know, a magnet attaching to metal. It's like, wow, this is what I'm... These are answers to questions I've always had. And now I've got a good answer. And that's exactly what I believe the people were experiencing here. Now, I want to zero in on the word doctrine here. He says, he, they were astonished at his doctrine. What does that mean? Well, doctrine is simply a set of beliefs that is taught by somebody. Obviously, Jesus had perfect doctrine, right? Right? He was teaching the truths of God's word that illuminated people to biblical uh, truths or you know, to practical truths and opened their understanding to what God wanted them to know. And this isn't the first time. And, and throughout his ministry, uh, this is the way people were responding when Jesus spoke. In John 7, 46, <laughs> the officers answered and said, Never man spake like this man. Never man spake like this man. Luke 24, 32, and they said one to another, this is after the resurrection, this is the two that were walking to the, on the road to Emmaus, and you know, Jesus kind of covertly shows up and walks with them, and he, he begins to expound the scriptures to them about what was to happen to them and, and all this, and, 
and he reveals himself in that room, and then he disappears. But they are talking amongst one another now. And he said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Wouldn't it be nice? It would be really nice if Jesus was right here, and he could just expound all those things. And we could ask questions upon questions upon questions, and he'd go boom, 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 boom. That'd be really nice. He's not here, though. But when he was there, people were like, wow, listen to what this man has to say. The wisdom, the graciousness. You know, when he was, when, when he was in Nazareth, even though he was rejected, the Bible mentions about how he gave out, how he spoke with such, he used gracious words. I mean, it's just powerful stuff. Yeah. But we see the response there to his doctrine. And the Bible gives us good doctrine to believe. Proverbs 4.2, For I give you good doctrine, forsake you not my law. And it's our duty to learn that doctrine. And to understand it. So that we can apply it. You know, there are a variety of religious institutions today that emphasize things like catechisms. The teachings of the church fathers, or they'll say certain scholars or whatnot, and, and they'll even reference decisions made by certain councils and synods and things like that as being authoritative and, and, and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that in some respects you can't, you can't get some insight from some, some people and, and so forth, but so much so that there are even long-held traditions and belief systems that get elevated, even that to that above the Word of God. I've even heard of some places saying their catechism even corrects what God's Word has to say. And that isn't blasphemous. But my experience, that is not a very good way to go about things. I remember growing up in what I in, in my religion, and I remember sitting in classes every week through the school year. Um, they were called CCD, and I remember one thing that really caught my attention. And I, I don't even remember how old I was. I know I was in elementary school, but I remember them. One of the teachers, and they were sincere, and they were nice people, and I think they were trying to do what they knew was best, but. But they made a statement that I never forgot. And they said, you know, over the years, our church has changed. And I thought, and I was thinking, and I was listening to this, and the whole reason they said why they changed was the hope to get more people in. And I thought about that for a moment, not knowing much of anything, but believing God's word was true. And I kept thinking, and I thought to myself, I was like, How, who gave them the authority to change God's word if what I'm believing, at least that's what I thought at the time, was aligned with God's word. You know, really, it really it bothered me. I was like, who, who are these people to go and change God's word? Well, I found out they, you know, <laughs> later on, uh, there was a lot of things that they didn't uh, line up with God's word. And it was all based on oh, traditions and, and ideas and thoughts of, of scholars and creeds and synods and all that kind of stuff from the past. Do you know that that can get to, so bad to the point where the, those traditions and teachings will actually void out the Word of God and make it powerless in the lives of people because people will accept those over just the, the clear, clear blue verses that you can find on those same subjects. If you go to Mark chapter number 7, Jesus will we'll come out on this eventually as we study through Mark, but there was a situation here where the Pharisees and the scribes try to call Jesus in on the carpet for the disciples not holding to the tradition of the elders. But verse 6, it, it says here, He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, 
that is to say, a gift by whatsoever thou mayest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer them no more to, be, to do aught for his father or his mother. Verse 13 goes, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Notice here, that these traditions, they, they void out, if you will, in the minds of people the validity of the Word of God, to where they can even be elevated above the Word of God. But the thing is, if they're not aligned with the Word of God, they're worthless. They're worthless. Because God's not going to judge us by what some man says, or some person, or some church, or some creed, or some synod, or some council. What's going to be at the judgment seat, or the judgment is this thing right here. His word. Jesus said that in John 12, 48. It'll be by my word that you will be judged. Not anybody else's. That's why we need to, to know what it says. We need to get our doctrine from here more than anything else. You know, what we believe is doctrine should have a biblical basis. And, if it, and it doesn't matter if it isn't popular amongst the majority. Now, there are a lot of things that the majority, and I'm talking about within Christendom, may believe, but that's not always right if you begin to study it with the Scriptures. And I'm not trying to be hard-nosed by any means, but at the same time, too, we want to try to be as biblically accurate as we can be. We, that's our goal. That's what we want to be. By God's grace. Now, nobody has the corner on the Bible. There are some people that think they do, but they don't. But, but you know... We, there's a big difference between some that are more scripturally accurate than others, closer to the scriptures than others. We want to do our very best and have a gracious spirit also with those that, that don't have, may not quite have all those same doctrines, but at the same time, too, are still tri striving to live for the Lord. They, you know, give people some grace if they don't believe exactly like you do. I, I'm sick of that, th this nonsense where we, we cut down people who aren't exactly like me. You know what? That's just a bunch of sectarian pride that really it needs to knock. It needs to stop. You know, there's some things obviously we, we don't we don't cross the lines on. But at the same time, too, people that are very close to what we believe. You know, let me tell you something. We've got some problems that need to get corrected in our own movement of the pride. You know what? Nobody has it all together. And if, and if people are preaching, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm thankful for them. I really am. Because we need a whole lot more people saying that right now in these days in this nation and the nations of the world. When it comes to doctrine, the Lord is the final authority of what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong. His word reveals those things as we seek to know the truth of matters by the grace of God. His doctrinal authority. Secondly, we see the demonstrated authority. Mark continues the narrative regarding Christ with two instances that display Christ's authority over the creation. Things distinctly incapable for a mere human being to do. We see first off it exercise over the devils. Verse 23. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about. You see here, first off, this demonstrate authority over the devils. The devils. The Bible teaches that demonic activity exists in the lives of people. In Bible days and even today. It is, it is alive and active today. Let me tell you something. Don't think that the, that the devils went on vacation after the Bible was done. They are active and they are involved. And you can see it even in our metro area. There is a lot of this garbage going on. 
And you know why it's what it is? There's an influence of, of the evil one. There is the spirit of Antichrist that still exists as it was in those days as it still is today because there's, a, there's an Antichrist they want to push in. And it won't come in until the Lord Jesus Christ allows it. And we, we're taken up out of here at that rapture. But until then, uh, there will be a battle. And there, is the ba there are battle lines that are drawn right now. Don't think that, there are, that the other side doesn't even understand, uh, doesn't believe that too. Because you know what? With some of the things that we have seen even in our region, there has been a direct attack against the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll say, they'll say blank uh, a political leader, but they'll also say blank Jesus right next to it. Because they understand that certain things are, are, are going on right now that have spiritual ramifications. I could tell you about some things that are going on in, this twi in the Twin Cities right now that make your hair stand up on edge. Because there is a devil here that wants to steal the lives and the hearts of God. God's people and people all around us and we as God's people are here to pray for people and to reach them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take your job seriously Christian because there's a lot on the line today. There are devils at work and they are very strong and they're very determined but you and I have the, are, are made kings and priests unto Jesus Christ. We have ruling authority over them and we can pray them down. Thankfully, that God is, is still at work and He is far greater than them all as displayed in this case. The Bible teaches that demonic activity still exists today. And here was, in this case, in, in our text, was one such person who had given himself over to such an influence of an unclean spirit, but Jesus told the devil to take a hike, and he did. Do you realize today that the devils do not listen to human beings. They don't. They don't. We don't have the power over them in our own flesh. The devils don't obey at all. In fact, there was an instance where some tried to do this in Acts chapter number 19. Acts chapter number 19. It says here in verse 13, there was a few guys, these sons of Sceva, who were trying to be exorcists, if you will. And the, the, it picks up here in Acts 19, verse 13, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had, an evil, had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was, le was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Notice the response. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. See, they don't have, the devils don't have to listen to us. It's through the power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only power and authority we have. And we have to be submitted to him, by the way, too, to be able to pray those things out. But, you know, you and I going, hey, devil, get out of here. That's not, you're not going to have any luck, all right? Let's just put it that way. Actually, you're going to have them turn on you. They have to be prayed out through the name and blood and authority of the Lord Jesus. That's the only authority and power we have. But you see here, nobody could, could obviously dispel them naturally, but then Jesus comes on the scene and he does it without any, without any problems. And that gets, that gets people's attention. And they start talking about it quite vividly as we see immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about. Because why? The authority he had com to command those unclean spirits and they obeyed him. People couldn't do it, but he could. Number two, over disease. Look at verse 29. And forthwith, when they came out of the synagogue, they entered in the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and a nun they call, tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Here we see Simon Peter's mother-in-law was sick. She had a fever. She was lying in bed. No doubt, not feeling hot at all. <laughs> How do you feel when you have a fever? 
I don't know about, about you, but usually if I, if I get a fever, I'm pretty achy. I'm kind of like, oh, you know. It's not a fun feeling to have. You, you feel really hot, and you feel really cold, and you can't get comfortable. Who knows how high it was? We don't know. But we know that she was sick, and she was not able to move very well. Then Jesus found out about it, and then he came over to her by the bed there, and he just simply took her by the hand, and all of a sudden she felt like a new woman. She felt like a new woman. She was changed. She was healed. She felt so good that immediately she, she got up and ministered unto them. She began working amongst them. And I think that's critical to understand of what exactly she felt immediately after Jesus had touched her. I don't know about you, but usually when I'm sick, it might, you know, I might feel better the next day, but sometimes, especially if you have a fever and get real sick, it takes a few days to kind of get back to what we would call 100%. But she was 100% right away. <laughs> I mean, Jesus' healings were complete and they were sufficient. And that's... And that was, that was the way he worked. She probably felt, as we might put in, in some of our slang terms, she felt like a million bucks. No doctor at that time or even now could heal someone that fast and so effectively. But Jesus did, demonstrating again his authority over the creation. Number three, we see the diverse the news evidently spread quite fast that a miracle worker was in town staying at Simon's house that people with so many different needs came to him looking for the same relief that the first two examples experienced in verse 32. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils and all the city was gathered together at the door and he healed many of them are many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Here we see a diverse group of people. Lots of different needs represented here, isn't there? And he graciously used his authority to help them all. You know, people have needs, don't they? Say, I know my needs. Yeah, you probably do, just like I know mine. But you, you get talking with people, and if they'll open up to you, you'll be surprised what people are going through right now or have just gone through. You know, I spoke to a gentleman this week who just a few months ago buried his second wife. He, he lost two wives to cancer. I talked to another gal who who had an is issue with, um, with a, uh, a daughter and some children that she had that had issues that were the result of some drug use and the challenges. And you know what's interesting about that gal is that she was very, she was a very bubbly individual. I'd seen her multiple times in the past and always very bubbly and happy. And she was when we were talking, but she was saying how good God has been in helping helping them through that. You know, people have a lot of problems today, and they're facing a lot of different things, and, and a lot of times we don't even know what it is. Sometimes we, we get the brunt of the negative side of it because of the stresses they feel. They, they lash out and they do things that we think are wrong and, or we know are wrong in, in, in cases. But you know what? There's a, if you start peeling back the onion a little bit, you begin to realize there's sometimes a very good well, a good reason why this is going on and why they're reacting the way they are. And what it just tells us is that people need Jesus. They really do. You'd be surprised what's going on in the lives of so many people. And there's only one who can help people, the Lord. And it is our job, Christian people, to point them to the one who has demonstrated the great authority to help. That's our job. In fact, when people have those problems, it is the best opportunity to point them to Jesus. Because he wants to help. 
Because the problems of the human race are too big for us to solve. But they're not too big for God to solve or to help, to navigate and survive. There's a song, I don't know who wrote it, but, but I'm sure you've heard it before. Some, it goes on something on the lines of people need the Lord, right? What a thought. What a thought. People need the Lord. Do we think about that at all during our weeks? May we not be so wrapped up in ourselves and our plans and our goals and our objectives in life that we don't realize and don't stop and think for a moment that there are people that God is intersecting my life with this week that need the Lord. Yes, they need salvation, and they're hurting, they're hurting people. They're dealing with problems, and they'd be just so delighted that a Christian person actually cared and talked to them and said, I will pray for you about that. Do we have that kind of heart? That's the heart of our Lord. You know what? He was in Simon Peter's house. I don't, we don't know what, they were probably just fellowshipping. And then all these people came and said, God, we, the Lord, Jesus, we need help too. And he was delighted to help them. May God give us that same kind of spirit tonight. Because without the Lord, people don't have hope. And we understand that. We who understand that are responsible to do something with that truth. And we can point them to the one who came to this world to give every human being hope in their circumstances and for their eternity. Because as we see here and as we'll see throughout the study, he's got authority over all. We may not be able to solve people's problems, but we know one that can solve them, help them, guide them, and empower them to get through it. Thirdly, we see the dependent authority. Verse 35, In the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. This verse could be a whole sermon itself. <laughs> I'm going to be very short on it tonight. Jesus, as we can see, was a very busy man. But he made prayer a priority in his life. He made prayer such a priority in his life. He spent time with his heavenly Father alone, in the presence before he started his day and before the demands of the day swelled around him. Hey, if Jesus needed to spend time in God's presence, how much more us? How much more us? Hopefully this week you spent time in God's presence every single day. If you did not, then let this week be the week that you spend your time or spend time in God's presence every single day. If you and I hope to fulfill the Christian life at all and be the witness we're supposed to be at all, you and I have to spend time with Jesus. It's impossible otherwise. Spend time with God. It's got to be appalling to God when Christian people don't think they need God's help to do whatever it is. It's got to be appalling to them. Oh, yeah, yeah, I don't need your help, God. That's what we're saying. We may not verbally say it, but we are saying it directly with our actions. Actions speak much louder than our words. And we need to, we need to, to see that Jesus got alone with God. Got alone with his Father. We as Christian people like Jesus need that time alone to worship, to fellowship, to intercede. And throughout the ministry of Christ, Jesus was found praying. In fact, you can see several instances in the book of Luke where he gets alone with his Heavenly Father. If we hope to accomplish anything of any lasting value, you better pray about it. And you better make it priority number one. In fact, we should not take on something, whatever it may be, if we have sufficient, insufficient time to pray about it. That thing will be destined to fail miserably or succeed over even more miserably. 
Jesus prayed, so it's needless to say for us, we need to as well. Whatever it is, even over your jobs, even over your parenting, over whatever it is that you do and I do, we need to be praying for it. We need to be praying for it. Hopefully we will. And if we each this day, this week, take a commitment to ourselves, say, Lord, I'm going to be with you every single day. I wonder how your week will go. Try it, if you don't already. Well, fourthly, and don't worry, this will be quick. <laughs> the demolishing authority. Verse 36, And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. You know, Jesus sought to go to other cities to spread the gospel, and everywhere he went, there was a significant impact, wasn't there? Verse 39, that last phrase, and cast out devils. See, the gospel, when it's preached clearly, will evict devils out of the life of the lost people. That's why they, they feel such a weight off them and peace when they get saved. Why? Because you get the devils out of their life. They're forgiven. They're no longer oppressed. It will change the lives of individuals. It will change the direction of families. It will change communities for good. George, or ben Franklin was a, a friend of George Whitfield's. George Whitfield was a powerful preacher during the First Great Awakening here in this country in the, in the 1700s. Franklin was quoted as saying this of what he experienced amongst the, the residents of, I believe it was Philadelphia, after Whitfield came through and people had gotten saved and their lives changed, he said this, It was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were growing religious, so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. Wow, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be a lot better spirit to be around in our communities? Where, where, wherever you pass, you heard people praising and singing to the Lord Jesus Christ, and people were joyful in their, in their households, and they were, they were experiencing some peace maybe they don't normally experience. Well, guess what brings that about? The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ when it's truly given out, and it impacts the lives of of those that receive it. Wow. It demolishes the devils that want to cause chaos and confusion, corruption and crime. They cause us to cry. It causes agony to this human race. Jesus came, he made a difference. Guess what? Jesus saved you. He can empower you and I to make a, an incredible difference as well. The question is, will we go and be the person that God wants us to be? This was part of the Galilean crusade. Powerful times. We'll continue more next time from the Gospel of Mark. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for this evening's time in thy word. I pray that it was profitable and helpful for each and every one of us to bring glory to your name. I pray you bless now this time as we have this, this time of invitation. May your word.